something to now just under 1150 packages. The more you install, the more packages are required. As we've mentioned, Red Hat Enterprise Linux varies in storage requirements from 3 gigabytes to 5 gigabytes for minimal to full installations, which by today's standards is a minuscule amount of storage. So on any system you intend to put EL6, you should have at least that much storage available. Ideally, you should also consider separating your installation from where you'll place your key files like the home directory or the var directory for the storage of databases or for the storage of users home items. So for example, if you intend to use your server as an Apache and perhaps FTP server, then chances are you'll make heavy usage of the forward slash home mount point, in which case you would want to consider placing the contents of home on a separate physical storage device to separate the I.O. and to improve the I.O., keeping it independent from the operating system and thus improving throughput. So wherever possible, separate your I.O. streams to different physical media to realize improved throughput. So this is moving forward. We're just beyond roughly 10%, and we should be done with this installation momentarily. The additional consoles are always available, so you can see what's happening on the other screens. Just take a look using Control-Alt F1 through F5. 6 and 7 are there, but with no data. And as mentioned, there are a number of things that have changed with this release of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, including the location of the GUI when the system boots on Control-Alt F1, the change or switch from SysV init to upstart, although upstart behaves similarly, booting the processes in specific run levels and controlling them, starting them and ending them as appropriate. But nonetheless, it is a shift away from traditional sysv init to a new environment, as well as a number of other changes, including the move away from general names such as dev SDA to more specific names such as the location in the dev tree of the object on the bus, somewhere on the PCI bus. So this is moving forward nicely. Let's time elapse it so that we can pick it up at a later point. So our installation has been time elapsed and it is almost completed, at which point we'll reboot and the system will come up for the first time after having clobbered the Windows OS that was on it. And just like with prior versions of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, this version will store a copy of the kickstart config file in forward slash root. That's the Anaconda KS CFG file, which can be used for subsequent kickstart installations, which, for example, for similar hardware would save you a lot of time and hassle in the event that the installations are to be duplicated or mirrored. So you can always place that ks.cfg file or copy it to ks.cfg file on your network repository and reference it using the ks option during installation. So that would be for example ks is equal to the location let's say http colon forward slash forward slash 192.168.75.101 slash Linux CVT slash ks.cfg which would contain the options necessary to drive the process and of course any options that are not present would cause the Anaconda installer to prompt you for input. So we've installed Red Hat Enterprise. Let's reboot. And this will boot from the CD. And if we select to boot from the local drive, we'll be presented quickly with the option to interrupt the process.
and we can modify this entry by pressing P to unlock the grub entry. This is to prevent unauthorized access. And then, of course, E to edit the entry. And this is the kernel option. If we edit this line, we can force the resolution to be something that's acceptable. And then we can boot using the B option. Now notice the security lock. This is because we've encrypted the hard drive. If we press escape, we're prompted for the password. If we don't specify the password, we're unable to boot the system. Now the services are starting. And there's, of course, one caveat that every time you boot, you'll have to supply the password to decrypt the contents of the hard drive, which means for remote configurations, this may be less than ideal, unless you have out-of-band access, perhaps via a DRAC card or some other means of connecting to the box outside of the console. This is the first time launch screen. Let's move forward. This is the license agreement. And this is an option to connect to the Red Hat network. This stage will skip it, but for production systems, it absolutely makes sense to do so. And we'll tell it, no thanks, I'll connect later. This is, of course, for patches, updates, so on and so forth. And we can create an ancillary user. Linux CBT. For day-to-day -day usage of the system. Here's the option to use network login. That allows us to configure... LDAP and if you need more control when creating the user specifying home directory and so on if you click on the advanced button this presents us with the user manager application which allows us to add the user and make changes that are non-standard otherwise standard settings will be derived such as placing the user in forward slash home forward slash username this checks the time with the appropriate offset from GMT and this can be synchronized across the wire using NTP here is a default list of servers that will be consulted and configured in the ntp.conf configuration file and this returns an error to configure kdump that's not a problem we can skip that that should be cosmetic and here's the startup screen. And now we have the option to log in. Of course, this is all of what we didn't see for the other installations. So to log in, we select the user, single click. Then, of course, supply the user's password. And this will give us a GNOME desktop momentarily, and we'll be up and running. Here's the desktop. Typical settings are available, such as open terminal, etc. So we're up. And of course, the other consoles are available. This is Control-Alt-F2. 
this is Control Alt F1. As we've mentioned, the GUI has been moved to Control Alt F1. And as we cycle through three, four, all the way through seven, and it doesn't respond, back to one. So we've again set up our system accordingly. Let's just take a look at two. We'll log in. And a dump of the disk should show the configuration. So it's under Dev Mapper Volume Group, short host name, home, and that's its size, roughly 20 gigs, and the root file system, which is 50 gigs, also under the same volume group, but a different logical volume. So our system's up. This is how we set it up insofar as the kickstart config file is concerned. It's anaconda-ks.cfg, which contains the settings surrounding the current installation.